Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such an exciting show for you this evening. Oh, my goodness. The legendary Corky Fornoff Hollywood stunt pilot is here. And uh, I can tell you right now, this is going to be one of the most amazing shows we have ever had. Before we get started, just a few tips and uh, information. So first of all, we have all these fall fly-ins going on and our Fly to Win Challenge, we had a, a winner that uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. Jeffrey Rogers of Portage, Michigan won a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset through Social Flight. And now Lightspeed is giving away another one. So all you need to do is get the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices. You can also go on the web to use Social Flight, but the app is what will get you into the Fly to Win Challenge by just checking in at your local airport. As you fly multiple airports, you'll be in that drawing and uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun. There's also uh, a button there for burgers. You can see all the cool places to fly for that and tons and tons of different events happening, fly-ins, fall fly-ins, things like that happening all over the place, pancake breakfast, et cetera. Uh, just go check out socialflight.com and uh, you can see everything there so that you can find out places to fly. And we also have our weekly uh, email that you'll get, uh, actually comes twice a week and gives you all of the cool things happening in your local area. We're just here to support general aviation and get everybody out there flying as much as possible. Uh, in addition to that, I'd just like to say tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Tempest Aero. Tempest has been a fantastic supporter of Social Flight. As an AMP and IA, I have used their products forever. I absolutely love using their oil filters, uh, which don't require you to have to put oil on the seals. They're all pre-lubricated. Uh, they come off easy. You never have a problem with your oil filters. And their spark plugs, which are wonderful as well, whether it be the massive or the fine wire spark plugs. And one of the great things is that even during all of the supply chain challenges, um, really Tempest has come through as the brand that's made it possible for me to stay supplied with these for everyone to still be able to get oil filters and spark plugs. And Tempest Aero is actually a brand. They're much more than that. They also include in that group their tools, uh, vacuum pumps, fuel components, really Alcor, Stratus, Marvel Chevler, Precision Air Motive, and Consolidated Fuel Systems are all part of that. So just a big shout out and thank you to them for making this show possible. Now, J.W. Corky Fornoff has captivated audiences at air shows and on the big screen for over 50 years. He's logged over 17,000 hours in over 300 different types of aircraft and flown over 3,000 low level aerial performances in nine different types of aircraft, including the T-6 Texan, the P-51 Mustang, the F-8F Bearcat, the Pitt Special, the Blanca Super Viking, the Christian Eagle, and the world's most famous microjet, the BD-5J. However, his air show resume is only the beginning as Corky is most known for his work on some of the most iconic movies in history. As a stunt pilot and aerial coordinator, Corky has literally transformed formed the aircraft scenes that we watch throughout the movie industry in films that include the James Bond series, Face Off with Nicolas Cage and John Travolta, Seven Days, Six Nights with Harrison Ford, um, and many, many more. He is so recognized by the film industry that he is listed on the opening credits for the James Bond movie License to Kill. There is simply no way we're going to be able to fit everything that he has to tell us in his story into one show. I'm hoping this is the beginning of our sequel with him. Buckle up for tonight's show. Let me bring Corky on the line and um, please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Corky Fornoff. How are you doing, Corky? Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Oh, I am great. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I can tell you, I'm like I'm like a kid in a candy store here. So excited to to hear. I mean, your your stories just go on and on. Um, I mean, let's let's dig into this. <laughs> well, that's what happens after 50 years, you know. <laughs> it's been great. If I hadn't lived it, I wouldn't believe it. Well, I, I'm and and I'm flattered that you've taken the time to join us here on the show. Uh, you know, Social Flight Live is about inspirational people uh, in throughout aviation and I can't think of anyone more than yourself that that has been part of air shows and movies and so many things that envelop our world so I'm, I'm grateful that you've taken time to join us 
Well, Jeff, I, you know, I really, that's one of the big things I've tried to do is to inspire people. And that my greatest reward has been pilots that have come up to me and said that I inspired them. In fact, um, back in the 70s, I was flying a show in Eufaula, Alabama, and a young girl waited. I was signing autographs, and she came up, and she said, you know, I'm just graduating high school, and I'm not sure what I want to do. She said, but I watched you fly today, and I've made up my mind I'm going into aviation. Well, a number of years ago, like 2010 or 2011, this girl walks up to me, this lady, and uh, she had a picture with her. And it was one that I had signed to her on that day. It was the same girl. And I said, gee, I said, gee, you know, how's things going? Did you get into aviation? And she said, yeah. In fact, she said, I just retired as a senior captain from United Airlines. And that was, you know, that was an inspiration right there. She said, you're the reason that I, you know, made aviation my career. And she asked me to sign that same picture again and date it. Oh, my. You know, so those are the things. Oh, that's you know, fantastic. Really make it worthwhile. You know, your... You know, the whole thing's really about the people, places, and things that have run through this thread of aviation with me. Wow. You know, so so your story ha is filled with amazing individuals, and it starts back when you were basically a, a kid. Fill well, us in yeah. on some of these some of these these names that you have told me that drop out here are just mind boggling. Well, you know, it was uh, they tell me that the first time I did aerobatics it was in my mother's belly. She was pregnant with me and my dad took her up in a PT-19 and did aerobatics. She wanted to kill him after that. But, uh, you know, that's how it all started. And then I've grown up. We always had aviators who went on to become famous that were visiting us. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, just took it for granted. It was it was something and you pick up a little bit of information from everybody. And so your your dad is, you know, obviously your dad was a pilot. You learned a lot of this through him. You got introduced to some key people that you've told me about through them. Tell me a few of these yes. stories, because these iconic names that seem to have been mentors are, um, are uh, really the list is is the icons of aviation. Well, yeah. And, you know, it's uh, that's just the way my life has been. It's uh, I was very fortunate that um, uh, people like uh, my father and Bob Hoover and Clay Lacey of people I grew up with. And, you know, I definitely consider them heroes and I've learned things from every one of them. Uh, but there were other people involved that, you know, I met and had conversation with. And, um, uh, you know, they really inspire you. And not only just in the aviation world. You know, I did the TV show, um, That's Incredible, with Muhammad Ali. And, um, you know, I didn't have a very good impression of him other than a fighter. And we were just off stage and we had the little jet there waiting to go on and he was going to be on this show too. And all of a sudden he walks in with uh, four or five other people and he comes up to the little jet and uh, he shook his hand out and he says, uh, Corky, I'm Muhammad Ali. And I said, well, I do who he was, you know, I was just surprised he knew who I was, but he knew everything about that little airplane. Uh, he loved airplanes. And we talked about the jet. So we talked for about 40 minutes or so. And really, he was really soft-toned, soft-spoken. And then when it came time for him to go on, one of the PAs from the show came and said, uh, Mr. Ali, we're ready for you. You know, will you come on? And he leaned over, he patted me on the back, and he said, Corky, it's showtime. <laughs> and he turned around saying, I am the greatest, and everything else, and walked out the room. I mean, I just saw, you know, two different sides. It was it was amazing. And then we talked uh, after the show and I uh, was really impressed. And uh, I met him again. And a number of years later, I was doing a movie called Face Off. And we had a production meeting at Paramount Studios. And a couple of the stuntmen and I went to have lunch. And they had this beautiful, like a crystal palace where their cafeteria was. And we walk in and the girl that you know, was going to see this said, oh, this is a big day. This is a big day. And we said, what are you talking about? She said, well, Muhammad Ali is here. Now, this place is filled with movie stars and starlets, you know, having lunch. So we said, oh, that's great. So we start walking to our table and Ali saw me and he got up from his table and came over and shook my hand and said, Corky, how have you been? 
he said, what are you doing? And we talked about some of the films I had done that he had seen, you know, Octopussy and so forth. And then he had to go back to his table. Well, we sat down at our table with the stunt guys and they all looked at me and looked at me and they said, oh, your street credibility just went up. <laughs> you know, so it's these are the kind of people, you know, that you, that you meet through this field of aviation. Isn't that, you know, isn't that amazing? Much, yeah, some of the others are, you know, I was very privileged. Um, uh, Bob Hoover, my dad, and myself flew a show for the 25th reunion of the Tokyo Raiders down on the beach in Panama City, by Panama City. And um, when we finished the show, I couldn't wait for the party because I wanted to meet, you know, Jimmy Doolittle. He's been one of my big time heroes. Well, Hoover walked me over and introduced me to Jimmy, and he shook my hand and he said, Corky, he said, you know, watching you fly that Mustang today, except for the color of the airplane, I didn't know whether it was Hoover or you. And uh, which to me was a great compliment. Of course, I was awestruck and it takes a lot to make me awestruck. And um, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Corky, you'd have flown for me. And I remember telling him, I said, General, I said, you know, those guys had the most guts of anybody I've ever seen going on what they could have been, you know, could have been a one way mission. And he squeezed my shoulder and he says, Corky, you don't understand. You would have flown for me. So what do you say? I said, yes, sir. That was it. You know, and then we had a good three days there with him and I sat him in the Mustang and, you know, just a great character, just down to earth. And like all pilots, that's what I love about pilots. Wow. What was it like you, uh, you know, you obviously played a big role when it uh, came to uh, some evolution of the, the entire air show circuit before we even get into where you went with the movie production. Um, and you, as you were flying as an air show pilot, you came, you, you really worked with a lot of the other uh, big performers at the time. Um, right. But you also helped evolve how uh, air shows are prepared for and flown and, and kind of helped save that industry. Can well, you talk a little bit about that? I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you. There were, there are two guys, actually three guys that really, I credit was saving the industry. And um, it was Paul Poporizny, a guy named Bernie Geyer, who was the head of FAA General Aviation, and um, Gene. And um, the thing that came up about that was Paul Poporizny in the old EAA Museum in Hales Corners had a meeting of air show performers and air race people. And um, Bernie Geyer and Jay Croft were there. And they uh, made this big statement, guys, we're trying to help this industry. You know, we've had accidents and this and that. We've got people yelling about stop air shows and so forth. So he They're said, the FAA uh, guys, right? Yeah, the FAA guys. They, these were the big bosses of general aviation. And uh, they said, now, we want you all to be honest. And this is an off the record meeting. Anything you say won't ever be held against you. Well, of course, the whole crowd shut up, except for Corky. I raised my hand. And he said, Corky, what do you want to say? I said, are you telling me that no matter what we say, you know, it's off the record? He said, yes, sir, it's off the record. I said, um, do you guys really think that we practice our air shows above 1,500 feet? And you don't think that we practice them, at, you know, right off the ground? They said, no, we believe you do practice them right off the ground like you fly them. I said, good. I said, um, why don't we set up a practice area so that you can do this? You know, set up a formula to do this. So Bernie Geyer said, Corky, that's a great idea. I've got a man, because he knew I lived in Wichita at the time. He says, I've got a gentleman down there named Ted Curtis. He said, why don't you get with Ted Curtis? Well, Bob Bishop and I had already formed, Bob came up with the original idea of how to have an aerobatic practice area so we could go out and practice whenever we wanted to. And we put that formula together, you know, having a ground safety person. And, um, you know, we would go to a prescribed area if another airplane came in to land or take off. And otherwise, we could practice our show. So the first official practice area, you know, aerobatic box, was at Newton, Kansas. Because Bob and I were working for BD Aircraft. And that went off well. So after that, before the meeting was over, Jay Croft and Bernie Gar came to me and uh, Clay Lacey and they said, guys, we know that um, you all have made movies and we need your help. They said, we have the 
studios, we have the Directors Guild, we have the Stuntmen Association, you know, and they are on us to have a movie manual. And they said, would you guys sit down and write a movie manual? So the three of us got together, Art Scholl, Clay Lacey, myself, and a, another gentleman, and uh, we formulated this manual. Now, this manual was supposed to be like, you know, when you get a charter service, you had to write your own manual. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't going to be something the FAA gave out because the whole purpose of it was to be safe. Also, what it did was we didn't have to go file waivers now. This was our waiver. This movie manual was our waiver. We could do whatever we want. We just had to make a plan of activities and give that to the FAA. And we could go do what we needed to do. Well, unfortunately, as years progressed, one guy in the FAA, I don't know who, decided, well, we'll just put this manual out. And the next thing you know, we go from about 15 manuals around the country to like 3,600. Mm -hmm. And of course, you were supposed to be able to prove you had worked on a film set, so you knew the mechanics of a film set. You know who was responsible for what. It's not just getting airplanes and showing up. An aerial coordinator, you know, as K2 had well explained, uh, has a big responsibility. And uh, flying is the fun part of it. You know, being creative and creating scenes is fun. But you have to be able, the aerial coordinator has to coordinate with every department, art department, wardrobe, you know, transportation, for your needs and what the those departments need when they need, if you have a, another pilot flying, when he can go to makeup and, you know, so forth. So it's a, it's a that's the hard part of it. The fun part is flying and creating scenes. Yeah, and and so when you talk about flying and creating scenes, um, you're obviously the, the most famous plane that, that you fly is the 5J. Tell me about flying that the BD jet. Oh, that is that is fantastic. Uh, um, I got a call from Jim Beattie and Bob Bishop. And Bob had talked Jim into talk, putting together a jet team. And, uh, you know, they said, well, Corky's had a lot of formation experience, fine formation shows with his dad and 51 in the Bearcat and then with the two Bearcats. And, um, you know, he's flown with the Blue Angels and they're good friends of his. Uh, let's call it. So they called me and I jumped in the Bearcat and flew up to Wichita or to Newton, Kansas. I, I have to stop From you for a second. That's not a phrase people hear. I jumped in the Bearcat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I grew up in the time when Warbirds, the guys that owned them, I mean, we flew them like somebody getting a Bonanza, you know, whether it was a Mustang or the Bearcat. So, but a funny story going up there, um, I'm cruising at about 15,000 feet and start letting down into uh, Wichita, you know, air traffic control. and um, they tell me I've got a Gulf Stream up ahead of me about two miles, all, you know, at 11 o'clock position. And then they tell the Gulf Stream, he said, uh, Gulf Stream, such and such, we have another Grumman that's going to be passing you off to your right. And because I just sit there and run it up, you know, to the barber pole, running up about 400 miles an hour. And I know he, <laughs> the fastest he could have gone was about 300 in the Gulf Stream, you know, letting down. So, uh, they came back and said, gee, can you get him to come a little closer to us? We'd like to see it. What is it? And they said, well, it's a Grumman Bearcat. So I got close, and the co-pilot recognized the color of the airplane. And he says, is that Bearcat Corky? You know, and I said, yeah. And I just went on chugging on by him and fled on down into Newton. Now, it was <laughs> some of the fun things you have in aviation. But I got to BD. And um, I'd flown a lot of air shows with Bob Bishop before, so he kind of introduced me to the airplane. And then they checked me out in it. And, um, you know, you walk into this hangar and there's a little airplane and four, you know, three or four guys pick it up and put it on sawhorses. And you climb in so you get a cockpit checkout. You work the gear and everything. And I kept saying, gee, such a sexy little airplane. Why would you put the stick on the side? You know, well, I went out and flew the airplane couple of times that day and on my trip home in the Bearcat I kept saying I wonder if I can move the stick stick in the Bearcat to a side stick because that was just the most natural thing in the world you know but I had a, I had a blast with that airplane but getting back to Jay Croft and Bernie Geyer who who really saved aviation they asked me they said uh, they wanted us to make recommendations on flight lines for the different speed airplanes uh, the problem we had with the jet 
was that it was so small and our cruise speed was so high that we didn't want to be out on the 1500 foot line, you know, where you had to be if you were over a certain speed. So we sat down and figured everything out with Bert Rutan and Les Bourbon and Bishop and myself and I said, gee, what can we do to get to the 500 foot line? Well, I talked to Bernie Geyer and, and Jay Croft again. I called him in Washington and uh, Jay Croft said, Corky, I want you to go fly your jet. I want you to go to 75% power. He said, and then I want you to tell me what the speed is. So I did that and I came back and I called him and I said, it's 156 knots. He said, that's the 500 foot line. If your cruise speed at 75% is 156 knots, that's long. And I've had people, they don't know how did they come up with 156 knots for that 500 foot line. That was it. That's how that came about. You came out with it. <laughs> you know, well, the airplane did, but I mean, that's, that's the way that 500 foot line was determined. You know, then they asked us, they, um, uh, Charlie Hilliard was there and they got, uh, Charlie and I were standing together and they said, guys, you know, we need to start a program for these aerobatic altitudes for air show performers. Would you guys sit down and Tom Poverizny had come in and would you guys sit down and come up with some basic guidelines for somebody in your group to be able to give out ACE cards? In other words, you would talk to somebody, uh, watch their performance and make recommendations. If you made a recommendation to the FAA, then they could get their ACE card. Now it's now called an ACE card. Then it was just called the low aerobatic card. So we did that. We put together. I know Charlie and I had worked a good bit on it. And the biggest part of it really was besides some basic things of G loadings and altitudes, you know, and, and vertical penetration and so forth, it was psychological. Why do you want to do this? You know, and uh, you wanted to make sure you didn't get somebody just there to say, gee, I want to be a hot dog, you know, and that kind of thing. So that's how the original lower aerobatic cards came about. And we had them. I know they had the Eagles aerobatic team was just starting at that point. And, um, you know, so we were the, the first ones to have it. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. So, so like really the, the foundation of like what the airspeeds are, what the rules are, how you get a, an ACE card. I mean, it, the, the, you were with the founding group of how all this got done. And, and, and that's why I'm saying that. Um, if ICAS, which I'm one of the original members of, I was like number seven for ICAS, <laughs> was that the, um, uh, you know, these two guys, Bernie Geyer, Jay Croft, you know, and Paul Poverizny, really set the standards in concrete and saved that industry. I mean, you had, at that time, you had, um, in the mid-50s, they were trying to get rid of the Blue Angels, you know, and the Thunderbirds. And they, that's happened again, starting in the late 60s, early 70s. You had, you know, congressmen and saying, gee, why do we need this? It costs a lot of money. Uh, it's dangerous, you know, and these sort of things. Hmm. But one other thing did was Jay Croft got a hold of me and he says, Corky, he says, we got one other problem. He says, you know, we've got all these warbirds out there. And we have a system now where they can just go fly it. There is no real regulations. And the problem we have is that we've noticed where accidents have happened. You have guys that flew them in the war that have no problem flying these warbirds. But now we have guys that have never been in that type of equipment that are getting, you know, these warbirds and we're having some silly accidents. So they asked me to sit down and, and give them my ideas of what a letter of authorization should be, which is what they called it. And they adopted most of those ideas. Now, the funny thing was, now, here's the head of general aviation, Jay Croft. He sends me a letter. And in this letter, it says, to whom it may concern, Corky Fornoff is qualified in any warbird he wishes to fly in perpetuity. <laughs> so I got on the phone and I called Jay Croft in um, Washington. I said, Jay, I said, what is this letter? He said, uh, just keep it. I said, well, it's a letter saying I don't need a letter. He said, just keep it. You may need it sometime. <laughs> so I've had that forever and had a copy of it put on my wall, you know, framed and put on the wall. Oh, my goodness. That is uh, that is amazing. But Absolutely. if ICANN doesn't have, have a, uh, an award in that category, um, you know, 
the Jay Croft Award or Bernie Geyer Award. They should because they really save that industry and put it on a path and a guideline. Now, ICAS, um, my solo cross-country flight was in the T-6 from home of Louisiana to DuPage Airport. And it was a big fly and I was excited. It was my solo cross country trip, 800 miles. I managed to make, yeah, I managed to make that 800 miles in about 1200 miles. I got in front of a weather front and thought I could beat it. Well, I didn't, I got pushed all the way to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. But the next morning when I finally get to DuPage, Paul Pover is he's out there and he parks me right next to his P64. And um, I'm looking at it, and there were some cute girls behind the, the barrier, you know, that they couldn't get any closer. And I, um, Hoover and my dad always told me, be humble, be humble. It's a privilege to do this, you know. So I decided, I'm looking back there at everybody looking at me, gee, isn't our, aren't I cool? You know, young student pilot, first cross country. I get out the airplane, I decide I'm going to leave my parachute on instead of leaving it in the airplane. I figured that would look cool. I get out and drop my sunglasses on the uh, catwalk of the T6. I bend over to pick them up and my D-ring gets caught. There's a little step to step on to climb in the cockpit. My D-ring gets caught on that. Paul Pover isn't he standing at the back of the wing. He didn't say anything. I stood up real fast and I hear pop and my parachute went out all the way across the left wing. You know, <laughs> and everybody behind that snow fence starts laughing. So, and Paul just looked at me and said, God thumped you in the head. And then he took me and he says, come on, we got to go to a meeting. So we walked to a meeting at DuPage and there was a gentleman there named Troy Dodd. And Troy Dodd and his brother started ICAST. They came up with the original idea of the International Conference of Air Shows. And so I'm standing in this hangar. I'm the young kid with Hoover, my dad, Captain Dick Schramm. Bill Bordalo, who was one of the original people with ICAST, and Troy Dodd and his brother. Over in the corner, there was a guy, I don't know if you ever heard of Dale Cripes. Uh, I believe he's dead now, but he had an original Curtis Pusher, and he's putting this Curtis Pusher together. Now, here I am, I'm looking at my heroes and everything else, and Troy laid out the principle of the International Conference of Air Shows. And my dad went right along and said, that's a great idea because you had... Being automobile dealers, we belong to the National Automobile Dealers Association. And that really, all the dealers in the local area work together to enhance the business. And that was the whole idea of the International Council of Air Shows. Now, it was originally set up because Troy even brought it up, and Art Scholl brought it up many, many times as we were forming this. Art was the hardest person I ever got to sign up because he was saying, gee whiz, you're going to have the producers are going to be telling us what we can charge and when we can fly and this and that, you know. And Troy said, the way this is going to be set up is performers only and producers of the shows. And everybody has to sign up every year so that you couldn't have one group say, you know, a producer say, well, I'm going to sign up six people. You know, so it was always a balance when you made rules or voted on things in within ICAS. Mm. And we started off in, um, you know, it was really well balanced. Now, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, you couldn't have, the, you no know, corporations could join. The, the idea was first starting. But of course, like everything else, it reaches a point. Yeah, let them join. We can use the money to help the organization grow. You know, right. and it, it, that's kind of the way it went. Yeah. You know, that's like Oshkosh. I mean, you can't, I mean, that's the greatest show on, in the world. And, um, but, when you see Oshkosh from what it was in the beginning, you know, and for the first five or 10 years, it's totally different. Right. They're right. both right in their own way. I mean, it's about the first 10 years, it was a convention of pilots. Yep. yep. And I used to get up early just to go out and watch the home bells fly in a circle. And then the classics flew in a circle, you know, and then new home build designs flew. And then the warbirds would fly. So it was from a standpoint of somebody that loved to sit there and watch airplanes. That was great. Yeah, now it's really, it's, uh, really it's really amazing. Um, hey, I want to make I want to talk about how you evolved from moving from the air show circuit 
into the movie industry and aerial coordination. Tell me a little bit about that and how, and, and how that started and what, what that took shape. Well, I had always been around films. One of our close friends to the family was a guy named Paul Mance and Frank Talman. And they were the big aerial coordinators and movie people, you know, for a long time. I mean, everything you've seen, if you've ever seen the mad, 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 mad world, that was Paul Mance flying through the billboard in a beach 18, you know. And um, so I always listened and was fascinated by being creative and telling stories. Um, so, you know, I kind of use those connections and listen to them talk. And they reached a point in flying these air shows. Um, I mean, gee whiz, I had the Mustang, the Bearcat, and the Little Jet. And I'm flying these shows. But it occurred to me, because we were gone almost every weekend, when was I going to have time to fly them where I didn't have to worry about something going wrong and making the next air show? You know, and you're doing the same routine over and over and over. So, and with a Mustang, it was bad because um, you couldn't just get in the Mustang and go fly by yourself. You know, with that rear seat, you always had a list of people that wanted a ride that mm -hmm. were friends. Now, the Bearcat, you're by yourself. The Little Jet, you're by yourself. But I reached a point one time that, um, uh, and we had a great sponsorship in Sonic Hamburgers, you know, and so forth with the Jet Team. But I reached a point um, uh, after our team broke up and I was still flying air shows. I said, you know, I found myself doing maneuvers and still concentrating on the maneuver, but I was doing them automatically. I mean, I felt it. I even, I'll tell you what I did one day. I had a friend, I had a Pitts S2A, and I had a friend get in the front as a safety pilot. And we went up to 4,000 feet. I put a blindfold on. I said, I'm gonna fly my pitch show. When I finished the show, I was 100 feet high and about 10 degrees off heading. Wow. Find that whole show. <laughs> by feel. Now, that's one of the things that my dad and Hoover always impressed on me was you ought to be able to know where everything is in the cockpit and fly it blind if you ever have to. And they said, that's why you want to be part of the airplane. You want to blend yourself with the airplane, be the airplane, literally, you know, like you're flying it. And um, two occasions, which we'll get into later if you want to, uh, it proved I went blind. Uh, you know, where I couldn't see in the cockpit, the vision came back. But um, two instances, flying blind saved me. And it's wow. because of the feel of the airplane, what you hear, literally what you smell, all your senses. And uh, as they used to say, listen to your ass. Because it's going to tell you G's, whether you're skidding, you know, whether you're yeah. zero G, the whole nine yards. But it's, uh, I reached a point where I was just doing it like a computer. I'd yeah. fly the whole show like a computer. And I said, gee, this, while it's still fun, it's not the fun it used to be. Right. And I wanted to be creative. And uh, the movies were going to offer that opportunity. And I had been called to do several movies, you know. So when I decided to do this was about the time that the movie company started making movies around the world. So you can't come back and do an air show when you're in Thailand. You know, it's not, because first of all, your day's different, it's time. But um, I went to the movies because I could be creative and I love nothing more than creating scenes because on movies you learn the story is everything. And some pilots get upset when they hear this because airplanes, cars, trains, boats, whatever, is nothing but set dressing. The whole thing of making a good movie is the story mm. so and you learn that quickly but you end up working with a-list people as far as cinematographers you know art department people things of that nature you just can't believe their talent and um, when you get into that environment and everybody's doing their job it's heaven it is you know and to be able to create those scenes and that's i think the things i've been most proud of and um you know, as we can talk about later in the program, where different shots that I created where <clears throat> I came back and gave them to the director and the director was so happy. He said, you gave me a better shot than I wanted. I knew wow. the premise he needed from the storyboards, but we created a better shot. Or wow. I made, a, I showed him 
my recommendation of how to make a transition from one scene to the next. Now, I'm bad at watching movies today. And the reason for that is, is being in the industry, and I'm sure K2 and his dad, Kevin LaRosa, good friends, um, when they watch a movie now, they're looking to see where the editing director made this cut or that cut, you know, to put it together and tell the story. Yep. And it's something when you see these professionals at work, for example, I see a lot of great aviation videos, but they're nothing but pictures of the airplane, which I love, but they don't tell the story of the airplane. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. They And, and it's not just details. I'm talking about uh, like if a director was doing it from a feature film, he would show the props start to turn, then he'd show the wheel starting to roll, you know, and then back right. it out to the whole. I mean, he would tell a story with pictures. Tell a story, right? Yeah. You did a lot and of that a, with, uh, with the Bond films. Can you tell me a little bit oh, about about that? Well, on the Bond films, um, unfortunately, in the last couple of them, uh, they used a lot of computer generated images. You know. Uh, when I did those Bond movies, I did four of them. When I did those, Cubby Broccoli, who was another one of the names I threw out, who was owned James Bond. He was Mr. James Bond. And his company was called Eon, E-O-N. And what Eon stood for, when he bought the rights to that series of books by Ian Fleming, he said, I want everything or nothing. And that's where Eon Productions came from, everything or nothing. And that's how I got the whole set. But you had to be able to do it live. If you couldn't do it live, he didn't want it in that movie. And like the stuff in uh, Octopussy Flying Through the Hangar or uh, License to Kill, where we I picked up a, you know, an Cessna 185, pick up a water skier, and he skis behind the airplane, and then I collect him, and then we, you know, fly off into the distance. Um, I'm going to show. You know, I'm going to show a few of these while we're while we're talking through it. I'm going to show show a few of these scenes. Oh, that's real. That's real. Now we practiced for a, a month or two with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was just great. I went to Washington and met with them, along with uh, Michael Wilson, the producer of the Bond movies, and they consented to uh, let us use their helicopter, and I got to pick the pilots. Two fantastic pilots. And I had a stunt man named Jake Lombard that I've used a lot in a lot of different movies. And Jake and I had talked about um, doing this. He had said, Jake always wanted me to get a B-25 and lower him out on a cable because he could use his skydiving skills, he said, to fly and move back and forth. Well, we got this chance with the helicopter. So they tie him on in the helicopter and we go out and they lower him. And sure enough, he could he could move 45 degrees in each direction under the helicopter. He could put his arms out and flare himself and go up to the tail boom and then ball up and swing out in front of it. So we ran just like a good test program. What we did was, while he's hanging on the wire, they bring him in close to my, I was flying to 172, and they bring him in close. And when he had enough control where he could come up and wiggle my elevator, then we would move to the next step. And the next step was letting him fly around on that wire till he grabbed a hold of the fuselage and climbed on. Wow. Now, everything was done methodically. I mean, we knew every movement, we always had an escape route, you know, for everything, if anything went wrong. So uh, it's not just hold my beer and watch this, <laughs> you know. Safe, safety is paramount above everything. I've told people I've got a yellow streak up my back so wide I can pull it around and make a raincoat. But if I know I can do it, you know, and picture it, and mathematically it proves out, then we'll do it. Wow. I want to do a few pictures here and a quick kind of rapid fire of what the what the films are and a quick, quick story about it. Because um, we've got a few that had to do with it. I know this yeah, one up. starts here. But quickly goes to this. <laughs> yep, that's all real. That's unbelievable. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, what we did was was, um, uh, and this is why the creative is so much fun. I'm in a meeting with Michael Wilson and another writer that writes the Bond movies, and Michael Wilson is one of the producers. And he says, Corky, here's the sequences we have. What can we do to capture them? So. Um, 
I said, you know, I said, um, they came up with one in one of the production meetings and they said, we've got Bond underwater. We got the seaplane sitting there and we got these pontoon boats, you know, for these cocaine runners to collect that. Now Bond snuck into there. He's underwater trying to rip up cocaine that's on this little underwater submarine and they see him. Well, he knocks one out, takes his spear gun, starts swimming away. He looks up. And these pontoon boats look just like that seaplane sitting there, you know. And um, he fires his gun. I say he fires his spear gun into the seaplane float, not knowing it's a seaplane, and figures that boat's going to drag him away from the guys trying to kill him. Well, all of a sudden, he breaks up on top of the water and sees it's a seaplane starting to take off. Now, I had done this before, and I knew that... The way to get him was just like you do with a skier. You swing hard left, he goes right, and then you come back together and he can grab onto the airplane. And we did it, you know, we practiced and we did it so that I could be on the step and he could grab on and then we'd fly off and he'd climb up on the float. Now, I'll tell you some of the funny things with that when we were shooting these sequences. We had, we were shooting in this lagoon right under the balloon that's in Florida. You know, there's this big balloon that goes up to 15,000 feet with radar. And um, we had cleared it with the, you know, with the Air Force and so forth that we were going to be working in this lagoon. Well, if you're in a seaplane and on the water, it's a boat. It comes under the control of the Coast Guard. If you're an inch in the air, you're under the FAA's control. And that's a restricted area you couldn't fly in. <laughs> so we had it worked out with the guy running the balloon, the blimp you know, with all that radar equipment that, you know, we'd be working there. Well, one day he had an appendectomy and off he goes and they bring in this new guy to cover his spot. Oh, no. Now he looks out his window because we could see where the building was. He looks out and um, I would come into this area on a long canal and six miles out, I would touch down on the water and keep the seaplane on the step to get to the location. See, so I'm a boat, I'm legal. We get there and we have a scene where they're loading the cocaine onto the seaplane and these boats are there. And all of a sudden I see two A4s <laughs> from the nearby base and, and they're sitting there knowing, knowing, you know, fighters and so forth. They're sitting there. So one is low circling to see what we're doing and the other one's sitting high. Well, the dummy stuntmen just playing around all have machine guns, you know, for the movie. <laughs> and they kind of start pointing them at it. And man, I got on the radio, the handheld radio for the set and said, put the damn guns down, put the guns down, because I know that one sitting up top is loaded. You know, they came from the base. They were supposed to protect the coast. And finally they did in the A4 circle and flew away. But that guy with the appendectomy, nobody told him we were shooting the movie over there. <laughs> you know. Jeez. And when oh, we leave there, shoot, we left there that one day and we're flying, we're going back to uh, Key West and there's a big yacht that would come out every day and try and get as close as he could to see the action. You know, they had tourists on this big yacht. Well, one day we leave there and our Coast Guard buddies decide to follow me in the seaplane back to Key West. The stuntman, Jake Lombard, gets out on the float, sits on the float to fly back. And he had a box of this paper money. And as we pass this boat, he's throwing this money out in the air. Now you got a Coast Guard helicopter following us, right behind <laughs> us. And we saw some of the people jumping off the boat to get the money, you know, that was floating down in the air. I mean, it's 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 so much fun you can't believe it. Oh man. All right, let's go to the next one. This is probably the most famous one you've got. Uh, yeah. the BD5J flying through a hangar. Yeah, that came about, um, I did that for Toshiba. The first time I flew through the hangars was for Toshiba. And um, Toshiba called me and the production company, Skip Ishii Production, and I ended up doing a lot of work for them over the years. And they said, um, Mr. Fornoff, we like the little jet and um, we want to use it in a commercial. What can we do? And they came to Oklahoma City. I was living in Oak City at the time. And I went and met with them at the hotel. And it's very funny working with the Japanese because they're very cordial. But they come in and uh, we go into this meeting and we sit down and they said, uh, 
okay, we want to make three commercials with you plus some print ads. Uh, what can we do? What can what can you do? And I said, well, just right off the top of my head and without thinking, it was like my alligator mouth overloaded my canary bird butt. I said, oh, we'll go fly through a hangar. Well, they loved it. They all, you know. And uh, so we sat down to negotiate that. And um, I've always used the flinch method of negotiations. So we sit down and it were, I gave them a basic price to do it three times, you know, fly through the hangar three times. And um, then they said, oh, is that it? I said, well, I got my crew. So then I added more money for that. And then they said, okay, is that it? And I said, well, you have me, you got to pay me. So they threw my price in there. And I kept going with little somethings until this one Japanese guy started sucking air through his teeth going, and I figured that was it. You know, that, <laughs> that was enough. So we signed that deal. And when we finished, there was a big executive from Toshiba. And he looked at me across the table and he said, now, Mr. Foreign Office, well, they call me Kakasan was what they called me, Kakasan. They said, um, now, we will pay you as much for the use of your name as we're paying you to do these commercials. Well, I grabbed that paper and slid it over and signed it quick and then said, why? And for years and years, my dad never knew what the meaning of my name, name came from. On the day I was born, my father was assigned his first Corsair with his name on it, you know, but it came from the Pacific Theater and just after the power section and before the cowling and the big red crescent was written Corky and like Coca-Cola flan. And down below that, in the um, just above the wing, was a Japanese symbol. I never knew what it meant. My dad didn't. He liked the name, called me Corky. Well, these Japanese told me, I said, why would you pay me that to use my name? And they said, well, <clears throat> there's a culture in Japan. And when you reach the level of Corky, you're a favored son of the gods and not to be compromised. And that's when it hit me that that American fighter pilot put Corky on there with that symbol because many of the Japanese fighter pilots were samurais and raised, you know, went to school in the U.S. and they would know that culture. And in a dogfight, if you can get a one or two second break or that Japanese pilot seeing Corky and saying, gee, that's somebody you're not supposed to compromise, would either leave the fight or say, I don't know if I want to mess with this. Wow. And that's where the name came from. Isn't and it's that, been good. This is nowhere on my birth certificate. <laughs> but I signed that, you know. And um, and then we went, my next step was to go to the owners of the hangar and say, gee, can I fly through your hangar? And they agreed. But the next step was to go to the FAA and say, I want to fly through a hangar. And the <laughs> FAA looked at me and said, you want to do what? And they laughed. And I said, here's the deal. I want to go fly through this hangar. And uh, my movie manual allowed it. And of course, you know, they said, have you thought about this? Yep. So we did. Now, wow. I'll tell you how something that saved my life there. When I was young and stupid, now I'm just old and stupid. You know, I was with a friend in the Mustang and we were at 14,500 feet over Lake Pontchartrain by New Orleans. And I was showing him, it was just one of these beautiful clear days. I was showing him that from that point over New Orleans, you could see Mobile Bay and you could see past Lake Charles, Louisiana. You know, and um, he told me, he was, he was my mechanic, Tony Guerrero. He says, um, Corky, have you ever flown under the I-10 bridge, Interstate 10 bridge? And I said, no, that sounds cool. So we kind of circled it and looked it over and I saw a big yacht go under the hump in the bridge. The bridge, you know, is about uh, six lane wide, two spans, you know, with the separation between the two spans crossing the lake. And the hump is about 60 feet high. So, and I saw this yacht go through it, so I know there were no wires. And uh, from 14,500 feet, I just did this one humongous big split S, you know, and worked the power up. And as we came down and leveled out, I ran it up to 505 miles an hour, the red line. 
and I went to put the no, some more nose down trim, and there wasn't any. It was it was at the at the end. And when I later, you know, told Hoover this story, he said, "Did you notice anything at 500?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "I didn't have any more nose down trim." He said, "You were at 500, you know, because that's kind of the way they were set up." So as we approach this bridge, and man, it gets big fast. I'm down there, everything set. Like I said, it was an easy deal because it's 60 feet high. When we hit that bridge, when we went under the bridge, I lost about 40 or 50 miles an hour, just bam. It hung me in my straps. And I thought, gee whiz, what did I hit something or whatever? And what it was, you're moving so much air that there isn't enough area for it to get out. Just like if you're standing on the side of the road and an 18 wheeler passes you, it kind of bounces you around. Well, you can imagine the air that you're moving at 500 miles an hour in a Mustang. So we shot through the first gap. There was a little relief and then they caught us again in the second, you know, span. And I just climbed on out. Well, made a big impression on me because I realized, you know, what had happened. I, this air just didn't have enough room to get out quick enough. So when it came time to fly through the hangar, I uh, called up a good friend of mine here again, Chuck Sewell, who was the chief test pilot, engineering test pilot at Grumman, working the F-14 at the time. And I said, Chuck, I said, here's what I've got myself into. I said, I know we can do it. I said, mathematically, I figured it out. You know, the hangar's 16 feet high. If I'm perfectly centered, I got six feet above me and six feet below me. And I said, um, help me on this, what speed do I need to go through? And he knew the P-51 story under the hang under the bridge. He says, I know the frontal area of the BD-5 because I had checked him out in the BD-5 jet. He said, uh, give me the dimensions of the hangar, every window you can open, every door you can open, and give me that information. I gave him all that information and he came back 155 knots. He said, if you go through it 155 knots, You'll never get pressure feedback in a you know, in an enclosed compartment. Now you would normally think the faster you go through to just get in and out. But if you'd have done that, the pressure inside that building with the air not being able to get out, it would have wanted to center the aircraft. Hmm. And at that point, you'd have probably skipped off the ground and into the ceiling, you know. So oh. um we just went ahead. I used 155 knots. Here again, well planned, step by step rehearsing. Um, my good friend Clay Lacey came out because he was filming it from the Learjet. So he followed me, not through the hangar. When I went through the hangar, he went right over the top of it. So he picked me up coming out the other side. I had a beach baron about um, oh, 150 feet parked outside the door entrance off to the side. And I knew when I reached that point, that I had to be below the top of the rudder on that barren, you know, and I'd have been centered. Well, they always shoot into light. And then we shot this in the morning when the sun's coming up. And um, we started off, I line up, I lined up on my marks. I pass that barren. I'm right at the right height. Everything mathematically worked and fit out. I go zipping through the hangar. And when I got in that hangar, the reflection of the sun off the concrete floor, I could see the rafters go click, 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 you know, as I went through it. Now I pushed it, you can see by that picture, I pushed it down so the belly's about two feet, two and a half feet off the floor of the hangar. Wow, that is, that's yeah. unbelievable. I'm looking for that picture again, to, cause you've done a, a, quite a few of those. And then there's also this bond one. Yeah. Well, the thing about the jet was um, when you, at that kind of, even at 150 knots, the BD jet has a situation where you get close to the ground in a level flight and you reach a point, you can feel the air under the airplane pushing you back. And I knew, so I knew I had a cushion when I felt that point and I wasn't going to go any further. Wow. Now that was so not, that. go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that 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 was not the only time you have uh, gone through a hangar. Uh, actually, yes. Let me <laughs> tell you about the Bond movie. Okay. Well, oh no, that one, that one, I crashed through. 
That's another great story. Crashing that jet star through that hangar doors. That's real. That was that was quite. Oh, that's real. That, you better believe that's real, baby. I think the thing was uh, we had several sequences there. Uh, we had one where um, we had two airplanes. One we pulled out of a, a graveyard. Uh, we put jet engines in it. My mechanics did a masterful job. The art department, the owner couldn't tell the difference sitting side by side on the ramp between the one we made out of the junkyard and the real one because we used them both. But that airplane, um, I had a helicopter beat the elevator up, all real. I mean, even lifting the nose. He was holding so hard on my tail, he lifted the nose. And then I made a 90 degree turn off of the runway headed toward this hangar at 60 knots. And <laughs> now this is this is where the fun comes in and the stuff you get to do with movies. Special effects guys, the ones we had there, uh I can't Bruce Steinheimer, one of the best in the business. He's a doctorate MIT graduate. So he figures everything out. And he said, Corky, what are your concerns? I said, well, you just don't go out and take a 22,000 pound mock-up, which just weighed, and make a 90 degree turn. I said, I'm worried about rolling it off the wheels. I said, I'm worried about keeping the nose wheel pinned down enough to be able to even make the turn. Because when I first went out and tried just for the fun of it, just to start the turn, when I, you know, turn the yoke, not the yoke, but the uh, tiller to make the turn, the wheel would turn, but it would just skip across the ground straight. So what I ended up doing was um, I said, we got to balance the airplane. So we filled one wing, the right wing with water. And we adjusted the struts to make it level. And then an old hot riding trick that we used to do, you know, in the 60s was we used big sheet metal screws and went through the rim of the, the wheel into the tire so that it would keep it from popping off. Now, my concern was, as I made this turn at 60 knots, that it would tip over and that boat tank on the, you know, the jet stars wing would grab the sand and flip it. Didn't want that. So when we put all of this together, I get it up to 60 knots, we're ready to film, we're filming from a helicopter, another helicopter, because we got one helicopter beating my tail as we're doing this. And we come down the runway, and when I got close to my turn in point, I pulled all the power off of the jet engines so that the nose would rise on its own. And then I nailed it again, just to get just to use the weight transfer. And boy, it dug in and went, made that 90 degree turn. And you'll see it in the film, and people say, hey, that doesn't look real, but that's real. Wow. You know, just like P2 was telling you. <laughs> It man, I just hung on and it went right around that corner. And I said, I must be the only person ever made a 90 degree turn in a jet star at 60 knots. Yeah. And then how'd you wind up in the hangar? <laughs> well, that's another trick. <laughs> when we go in this hangar, this was a one time shot. It has to be right. And this is what they pay you for. Um, I had to get the airplane up again to 60 knots because that's what it was going to take at 22,000 pounds to punch through those hangar doors. We're shooting in the high desert, at George Air Force Base, the old Air Force Base. And they couldn't pre-cut the doors because sometimes during the day, you'd get 60 knot gusts and it would have blown the doors. So with these MIT engineers figured this out. They said, we built a ram under the nose cone out of angle iron. And in the airplane, I had a halon system. I had six cameras on board. You know, and you know, they calculated all of that. Then to decelerate me once I went through the hangar, once I went through the hangar, they had these barrels that uh, they were going to fill with water. And in top of these big 55 gallon barrels, they drill various size holes up to four inches, two inches, one inch, so that when I went through and it starts to crush these plastic barrels, the liquid will come shooting out you know, help in the scene, but it also decelerates the weight of the airplane. They also had big boxes that were in boxes, in boxes, in boxes. And this hangar was just filled with it. Now they told me it was just gonna be water. As we get ready to go, the director, John Wu, a famous director, 
he did Mission Impossible movies and so forth. He says, guys, how far in that hangar is that airplane going to go? They said, because I want to put a special camera. We'll, we'll bolt it down to get that shot coming in. But this is a very expensive camera. I don't want to hurt it. But I want to get that shot. Tell me, how far will it go? So they told them. They backed the camera off three feet and set it. Now, I had to, here's what I had to do. When they called action, I had to, you know, come up on the jet engines, get it up to 60 knots. While I'm doing this, I'm turning on six cameras, you know, getting the halon system set up and watching my mark. I had to remember to shut the jet engines off just before I hit. Then I had to remember to collapse the nose wheel after it finally stopped. And that was to give the impression to the camera that the airplane died. You know, it comes in and stops and rocks a little bit. I collapse the nose gear, boom, it goes down like it died. Wow. So that's all you have to do. That's all you <laughs> had. And you had, you had the pressure on your back that it's a one-time shot. They had 26 cameras filming besides the six I had. You know, to catch oh, all the action, because you're not going to do it again. Well, I got it up to speed. I shut the engines off. I was about 60, 70 feet out. And the first time I could really concentrate on the shot, because I had done everything I did, I was still driving it, you know, to that point that I had to hit. And I remember about 60, 70 feet out looking up and saying, foreign off, what the hell are you doing here? And <laughs> bam. And we hit it hard enough that I left marks, you know, some marks on my shoulders from this uh, shoulder harness. Oh, now, my I hit, goodness. Yeah, the skylight above the pilot seat, we had put in with super glue, and it took a two by four to bust it out if I had to get out that way, if there was a fire. You know, like if it bent the fuselage and I couldn't get the door open. Well, as I go through the hangar and I start hitting these barrels, my big concern was fire because. The only thing we had in this mock-up besides the jet engines was a big hydraulic tank back there to run the steering and everything else. And um, it goes through that hangar, and all of a sudden, the second I hit that hangar door, that safety glass up top popped out on its own. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there going through there, and this reddish liquid's flowing all over me. And I'm thinking, Jesus, it's hydraulic fluid, you know? And I'm just scared to death because they got all kind of explosives going off and everything in this hammer. And I'm thinking, gee, call cut, call cut. I can't wait till he calls cut and I can get out of this thing. And it seems like it takes a director forever, you know, to call cut. You finally call cut. I get out and it's not hydraulic oil. It's a mixture of juices. They couldn't get, you know, enough water that they needed at the airport to fill those drums. So they went to the grocery stores and got all of the old expired milk and fruit juices. <laughs> and that's what they filled the drums with. Oh, now, my goodness. The oh, kicker cool. is, you know, it was the first one, the first film shoot I allowed my little daughter, who was probably, oh, four or five, to come watch. Now, you have to imagine, I'm going through this hangar. There's a helicopter behind me that had just been beating me up. And about 50 police cars chasing me, all the lights going and everything. I crashed through the hangar and everything else. Everything's settled. We get out. My wife brings my daughter to me. She jumps up in my arms and grabs my cheeks and squeezes them and says, Daddy, don't ever do that again. And now you're going to jail. <laughs> you know, so. Oh, said, man. Maybe, maybe that was a mistake having her watch that one for the first one. <laughs> Well, Corky, as I said in the beginning of the show, we're only going to scratch the surface on this. And and I hope that you will come back and join us to talk about some more of those stories because uh, it, it just it's fascinating. I could spend days talking to you about this. And, and I'm just grateful that you've taken the time to share it all with us. Well, it, it, it's been fun. Like I said, it's it's been something that's in there. You know, there's so much more. And really, the people and places and things that were, you know, that makes the story. Yeah. I just happen to be fortunate enough to to be there. Well, you are a true hero. Like, uh, of, of, and I love everything you've done for general aviation. You're an inspiration to so many. I want to show one last thing, and that is 
uh, just to, to show some of the these amazing films that you've done. Um, you know, go to your website, if anyone out there, do a quick search on Corky Fornoff. Uh, you will see there is just so much, uh, so much out there that we have just barely, barely scratched the surface. So thank you so much for everything, Corky, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us here on Social Flight Live. Jeff, my pleasure, pal. And, I, you know, here again, I hope it inspires somebody. Just be I, safe. Be safe. It, safety is paramount. That's it. That's it. That's so true. And I think that that may be one of the things that we talk about next time. That'd be wonderful. Okay, pal. All right. You take care and have a wonderful evening. I will. You too. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here again on Social Flight Live. Next Tuesday, November 22nd, we are here with Shane Woodson from U Avionics talking about some fantastic technology that they have, uh, stuff that we're using in, in our aircraft. And, and there's just more than, the more I dug into this, the more I learned about it, the more surprised I was about how much I didn't know. And uh, there's just there's just some cool things to learn about that. On Tuesday, November 29th, Brian Schiff is here. And you don't want to miss this show because it is titled A Night of Bad Decisions. And so uh, you're going you're gonna to want to uh, tune in for this one. It's going to be a lot of fun and very educational. Then on Tuesday, December 6th at 8 p.m., as always, Congressman Sam Graves, the ranking member of the House Transportation Committee, will be here with us on the show as well. And we'll learn a lot about um, how general aviation will be impacted now in the future. He's a pilot, an aircraft owner, has a lot of history in it, and can really relate to us in general aviation. Again, until next time, thank you so much for everything you do for to support general aviation and helping us support GA here at Social Flight. And I wish you all blue skies.